an advocacy theme. I think it's a really lovely follow-on from the, the release of the results. I don't know if you're all sitting through the session just now, the special session on the National Wreck Fishing Survey results, but I think this is a really lovely follow-on from that, given the, um, the findings on stewardship in that, in that session. So my name is Michelle Wenner and I'm a um, Senior Fishery Manager with the Victorian Fisheries Authority and wearing a couple of hats this uh, last couple of months also pulling together the conference. Um, so it's really lovely to see you all here and see everything come together pretty nicely. So first up today we've got Tim Sartwell yep, from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration in the US and he'll be talking about empowering anglers for habitat and science outcomes. Thanks. Yes. Thank you. Okay, and now I click on my name. There it is. Okay, thank you all for coming. Uh, my name's Tim Sartwell. I work for NOAA Fisheries, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Um, I'm in our external affairs office. My job is to engage with the recreational fishing community in the United States. Um, and it's an honor to be here today. You know, these talks are, are very interesting. You see titles like empowering, inspiring, working with, communicating with. So it's an exciting time and space to be uh, working with recreational anglers. And I think people are really growing to understand the opportunity here. So thank you all for having me and thanks for coming to listen. Um, I'll talk quickly about recreational fisheries in the United States. Um, I think you've seen a couple of these slides from some of our other presenters. Uh, then I'll talk about our efforts to engage around habitat and then recruiting anglers to fill some of our data gaps within our science and management process. And that's really the essence of our work, I think, in the past two years is focusing on not just the habitat, but also the science gaps. So together, NOAA Fisheries and our federal council partners manage 460 stocks or stock complexes in 46 management plans across the country. Um, of those 460 with a known status, uh, less than 10% are subject to overfishing and 20% are considered overfished. It should be noted that, you know, under our science-based management framework, that since 2000, we have rebuilt 47 total stocks. So less fish on the overfished list and improving in our management. So this slide is meant to illustrate that marine recreational fishing is big business and is a huge economic driver in many of our coastal communities. Um, the US Bureau of Economic Analysis recently put out an analysis of all of outdoor recreation in the United States. So they pulled together all of the conventional activities, bike, biking, boating, hiking, hunting, and boating and fishing were the number one conventional sector within the outdoor recreation economy. But as a whole, outdoor recreation in America represents just under 2% of the gross domestic product. It is a huge business, and as you see here, saltwater fishing with just under 14 million anglers, just under 200 million fishing trips, um, is a huge impact to not just the economies, but the resources as well. The Magnuson-Stevens Fishery Conservation and Management Act is the primary law that governs marine fisheries management in US federal waters. Uh, it was first passed in 1976, and it fosters the long-term biological and economic sustainability of marine fisheries. Its objectives include, <clears throat> excuse me, preventing overfishing, rebuilding the overfished stocks, increasing long-term economic and social benefits, ensuring a safe and sustainable supply of seafood, and protecting the needed habitats. And just as it did for commercial marine fisheries when it first passed, the Magnuson Act recognized saltwater recreational fishing as a fundamental activity benefiting the nation and affecting our living marine resources. Recreational fisheries continue to gain a lot of attention with our legislative branch on Capitol Hill, uh, especially with the passing of the Modernizing Recreational Fisheries Act, which was signed into law in December of 2018. So as a result of how the agency has evolved, we have traditionally had a strong focus on commercial fisheries. It manifested in a number of ways, and the Recreational Fisheries Initiative started as our effort to overcome this perceived bias from the recreational fishing community. The agency needed to engage more productively with the recreational sector to understand their needs and priorities, 
but it was never an intentional bias bias magnuson was built to remove federal or excuse me foreign fishing fleets from u.s waters and it was really just commercial fur focused um, from the start but recreational fishing has since been uh, recognized as important so the rec fish initiative has really two objectives externally establish a strong and trusting partnership with the recreational fishing community and internally ensure those considerations of recreational perspective is part and parcel to everyday decision making at the agency. That's what Sean Morton talked about yesterday, how we do that through our national policy. You heard Russ Dunn talk about the 2022 summit where we focused on a variety of topics. I, I wanted to focus on our previous summit, the 2018 summit, where habitat and conservation were a huge topic of interest. Coming out of the 2018 summit, we launched a two-pronged approach to engage recreational anglers. First, we wanted to provide funds for local restoration and conservation projects. And two, we wanted to engage locally on habitat issues that anglers cared about. So through the National Fish Habitat Partnership, we now annually solicit proposals for local habitat projects that specifically engage the recreational and non-commercial fishing community. Um, we've seen this program continue to grow interest. Um, we just closed our RFP for this year and got a number of great projects. Um, but this started right after our 2018 summit, and by 2025, we'll have a million dollars dedicated to local restoration projects with recreational anglers. Uh, quickly, the National Fish Habitat Partnership is 20 regional networks of practitioners whose mission is to protect, restore, and enhance the nation's fish and aquatic communities, and it's completed through partnerships that foster fish habitat conservation and improve the quality of life of the American people. Um, it is a state-led partnership, but NOAA has been a key federal partner since 2006. So I want to touch on a few of the projects that we have helped fund through this work. Um, that handsome young gentleman in the top right corner is my son. I was able to take him to a, uh, one of the projects that were funded in the Chesapeake Bay where they, the local fishing community, the Coastal Conservation Association, was building oyster reef balls to deploy into the Chop Tank River, which is a tributary of the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, on this top right corner was a project out of North Carolina where they again restored oyster reef in a small stretch of shoreline and planted uh, marsh grass. And the local fishing community there was majority Hispanic speakers. So they worked with the North Carolina Division of Marine Fisheries to translate their fishing publications to make sure that they could actively outreach and educate the local public as well. Down here in the bottom right, uh, we funded two culvert removals in Haines, Alaska, with the local subsistence and non-commercial fishing community there. Um, this particular uh, forest, the state forest in Haines, Alaska, is a huge producer of sockeye and chum salmon in southeast Alaska. Um, and it was a great project that included native planting along that river once the culverts were removed. And finally, in the middle there was a project out of Hawaii where participants translated 200 coral fragments, 20 small artificial reef structures, and restored 40 dislodged mature coral colonies off of the big island, or excuse me, off the main island of Oahu. So, you know, this is just meant to show a lot of the, the effort that's out there, the need that recreational anglers have, and their appreciation for the various habitats that support their passion. So, um, this was just a, a quick show of um, some of the projects. Now, this is really where we've started to focus a lot of our efforts here. And um, throughout the Gulf and uh, Atlantic and Pacific Coast, Hawaii and Alaska, we're really engaging with recreational anglers. That two-pronged approach mentioned diving in locally with the anglers to understand their habitat priorities. We developed this model where we engage at the local level and hold conversations with anglers, nonprofit groups, state governments, advocacy groups. We invite them all in and spend a day with them, telling them what we're doing in their areas, 
but also getting feedback of what they need and what they want. This has been a very successful model. We started in the Chesapeake Bay, which helped inform our strategic plan from our Chesapeake Bay office. We've gone to the Eel River in California, the Puget Sound in Washington. We just completed one in Southwest Florida, and there's one scheduled for Louisiana upcoming. So this model of engaging locally, inviting the local fishing clubs, your local charter captains to a place um, and to talk habitat has been extremely eye-opening and, and beneficial. So while our management process under the Magnuson Act is successful, it is a very public process, it is often a slow process, and it often produces frustration with the angling public with what they see as incorrect or inefficient management. Uh, recruiting and collaborating with recreational anglers is a way to help build the trust with the angling community and alleviate some of those frustrations while empowering those anglers to become more involved in not just the science, but also the management process. Uh, it doesn't come without costs. Um, managing expectations is huge. Uh, people think, I think if you'd ask Andy Danilchuk if people just want to tag fish and hope that tells them everything they need to know and they'll get to fish more. Uh, managing expectations up, up front, understanding the timelines of incorporating science into the management decisions is key um, to, for success. Additionally, supplement, not replace programs. In the US, we have recreational anglers who are extremely frustrated with our federal data collection programs, and they think that they can um, produce something that replaces the program. And I think that's a, a bad way to get started. It starts in a place of distrust. So you want to you want to try to supplement your current data structure and improve the accuracy of it rather than trying to wholesale replace it um, to meet the needs of of a distrusting community. And finally, sustained outreach. You have to recruit the anglers, you have to maintain communication and provide that feedback loop on um, what you've done and why you've done it. So I've got a couple examples here uh, of some projects that are ongoing that have been super successful. Um, currently in Mahi, or excuse me, in Hawaii, there's a Mahi punch card program um, the objective is to characterize the diet of mahi, which inhabit the surface waters in and around the main Hawaiian islands. And objective two was to identify and quantify the trophic links between mahi and Hawaiian reef-associated organisms. The way the South, or excuse me, the way the science center is approaching this is they knew recreational anglers weren't using the mahi guts, but they needed them. So in, to encourage them to provide that data to them, they've started this punch card program where if you contribute a stomach, you get a punch card on your punch card. And once you get 10 punches, 20, 10 stomachs are donated, you get a $50 gift card to the local tackle shop or Pacific Ocean products there in Oahu. Um, this program has been incredibly successful with over 563 mahi stomachs collected on Oahu alone. They've utilized the local media to build awareness of the project, and after their multiple radio interviews and magazine articles, they tripled their amount of stomachs donated in a six-month period. So they went from 94 in the previous six months to 254 in the following six months. So they're utilizing and communicating constantly with the recreational anglers to build awareness. Uh, and thus far, using PCR sequencing, they've identified over 752 prey items from the mahi around uh, Hawaii, which is super helpful in the management and understanding that population. So this is a, a pilot project utilizing California's party boat fleet uh, and their participation in research. Um, the California is known as the Commercial Passenger Fishing Vessel Fleet, CPFV. Um, and they're a well-organized group of party boats paying, you know, per person, take 20 to 50 people fishing off the coast of California um, routinely. And we have modeled this program after a cooperative bluefin tuna length sampling program that started between the Sport Fishing Association of California and the Southwest Fishery Science Center. But this project is focusing on copper rockfish and quillback rockfish. Uh, 2021... Um, 2021 length-based assessment indicated that a portion of the copper rockfish was overfished. Um, there was a massive reduction in the fishing season, area closures, um, sub, sub 
fish bag limits, and really a lot of frustrated anglers. And they wanted to find a way to engage with the anglers to better understand what the population is inside and outside of marine protected areas. And so now there are a crew of volunteer anglers that you can sign up to be a volunteer anger, angler, go on these fishing vessels, fish in a strategic scientific method, to, and I try to catch copper and quillback rockfish. Out of that, they take otoliths and fin clips. And from this research, this will be the first time that the stock assessment will have a length and age relationship for quillback rockfish, or excuse me, for copper rockfish from this fleet. So it's gonna really hopefully in, produce better science, reduce uncertainty, and allow those anglers to have a longer fishing season. But again, it's done cooperatively with the scientists, the captains of those vessels, and the recreational anglers in the area. Just a few other quick examples. Um, we've also funded putting water quality monitoring machines on for hire boats and commercial boats in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, harmful al they're trying to monitor and predict harmful algal blooms, which have a huge effect on their fishing. Um, we're using angler apps to statistically map offshore fishing locations. This was supposed to be a presentation here, but Scott was unable to come. Um, and this is really trying to get a better understanding of where the recreational fleet is fishing within potential offshore wind areas. So trying to identify and allow them to still have access to their fishing grounds. And this is, a, this is an article about you know, reducing barotrauma. And I did want to note that Paul Fisher and Ken Frankie are recreational anglers. Paul Fisher is one of the captains of one of those commercial, uh, the California passenger fishing vessels. And Ken Frankie is the president of the Sport Fishing Association of California. So we're utilizing their expertise to help fill those data gaps and improve recreational discard mortality. So three quick points, engage locally. I heard Kieran Heider say it yesterday, embrace the heterogeneity of recreational fishermen. Um, they're different, they have mo different motivations, they have different needs, they have different wants. Um, by engaging locally, you can ensure that you're meeting those needs and supporting um, the projects that they're passionate about. Find common challenges. Um, most of the time at shorter fishing seasons, right? <laughs> we want to allow people to go out and fish, the opportunity to harvest and recreational fish, but find those common challenges with your recreational anglers and then develop cooperative solutions, whether it's donating uh, gut content of the fish that they caught in filleted, whether it's participating in on the ground research, whether it's um, you know producing harvest data through an app. Find those cooperative solutions. It just doesn't have to be, here's what I caught, and that's it. There's, there's a desire to be a part of the science and um, there's willingness from recreational anglers. So with that, there's a couple QR codes if you have any interest, the NOAA RecFish program in the middle, the Hawaii study and the California Collaborative Research Program. But that is it for me. Thanks very much, Tim. I think we'll, um, hold, we'll hold, hold over some questions till the end. Um, but definitely a very fascinating discussion and um, I think model for stewardship. All right, so next up, we've got India Thompson, who's a uh, self-admitted passionate fisher and project officer with Tuna, Tuna Champions. Um, and she'll be talking about the Tuna Champions project and um, influencing positive fishing behaviour and norms. Thank Thanks, you. Cynthia. Michelle, sorry, before we start, um, is Serena Liu in the room? Um, she's the last speaker in our session today and she hasn't loaded her talk yet. So if anyone knows her, um, could that message be passed on, please? Right. They're going to load the next one up for me. Do you want me to go and get it myself? Perfect, and I just tap and I'm good. <coughs> All right. Hi everyone, um, my name is India Thompson and I'm the project manager for Tuna Champions. Before we jump into this, I just want to acknowledge Associate Professor Sean Tracy as a co-author uh, to this presentation. So just a bit of background. Southern bluefin tuna were heavily fished in the 70s and 80s. And to be quite honest with you, they were on the brink. 
In the last three decades, southern bluefin tuna have become more abundant to recreational fishers, and in particular on the southeastern coasts of Australia. What makes it interesting is the southeastern coasts of Australia are where recreational anglers were usually catching whiting and snapper, much smaller species, not large pelagic endothermic fish right on their doorstep. So for this reason, there were limited resources for anglers going out there attempting to catch these large fish and no real information on how to care for their catch. So why did we develop tuna champions? There was a problem, and now we need to fix it. What do we do to fix it? Well, we try to improve marine literacy in the recreational fishing community. And what's really important about this is many stewardship programs around the world target fish releasing, purposely releasing fish or dispatching fish. We thought it was really important to try and target both. And the reason for this is that many people who chase southern bluefin tuna like to keep one for a feed as well as releasing one. So it was important that we encompass both of these things in the program. Of course, benefits to the fish. Animal welfare is incredibly topical and we'd like to think that we're on the forefront of taking care and encouraging anglers to take care of their catch. An example of this, before this program began, many people would bleed their fish before they brain spiked them. Well, science, the heart is an involuntary muscle. That's why it's incredibly important to brain spike before you bleed. Of course, any benefit to the fish is a benefit on your plate, but it's also a benefit to the fishery. So we now have social licence. And last but not least, the recreational catch in Australia for southern bluefin tuna is a lot less than the commercial sector. So it was important for tuna champions to really harness and focus on fishers taking accountability for their catch, caring for their catch, respecting their catch, paying homage to their catch. And that is the focus of our program. So the cool part, what is tuna champions? Tuna Champions is a focused stewardship program. We use science, evidence-based information to create a code of conduct. And this code of conduct is for recreational fishers to use when they're on a vessel catching southern bluefin tuna, whether they're planning on releasing or dispatching fish. We have effective education and communication strategies. And we have seen in the last four years of the program an observable behavioural change in the recreational fishery. How did we do it? Well, we employed an incredibly good marketing company to come on and tell us what we need to do and the best way to get a recognisable brand out in the industry. One piece of advice that they gave us was don't spread the funding. Focus on one thing, do it well. If you try and do a heap of things at once, you end up doing it at a subpar. Focus on one thing, which was Southern Bluefin Tuna in our case. They also said keep your messaging clear. Keeping your messaging clear makes it easier for recreational anglers to decipher it and then employ it when they're on a boat. To do this, we have five topics. I call them tiles, whatever you want to call them, but five topics. Catch, handle, release, keep, and prepare. So before Tuna Champions, just going to do a few before and afters and show you what we like to target. Um, many people, as you can see here, the artery sit that sits behind the pec fin is close proximity to the skin. Before our program, people would make an incision to bleed their fish if they bled their fish quite deep into the meat. What this did, the blood ran straight back into the meat and did everything you were attempting to just do. So we take the science. We turn the scientific jargon into something that recreational fishers can decipher and replicate. And the replicate part is really important. We then post this onto our social media and one simple message about how deep you should cut using a blood knife got over a quarter of a million people in reach. Before, it was common for fish to be left on the deck to cook. What do we do at Tuna Champions? We take a 35 kilo southern bluefin tuna and we test this theory. We put it in a minus one degree ice slurry for six hours. After six hours, the internal temperature of that fish was still 13 degrees. Now we've got to get that information to our recreational anglers. So what do we do? We transform it. We share it in a way that they can employ the skills that we give them on their boat to make sure they're caring for their catch. So you can see on the left-hand side there, we talk about a one to one kilo ice ratio. So, you know, essentially you want one kilo of meat to um, one kilo of ice to one kilo of meat or one kilo of ice to one kilo of salt water when you're making the slurry. But really interestingly, change started to happen. 
On the right hand side, you can see evidence of social sanctioning. I'm sitting there on a Friday night and my phone goes ding. I open it and it says Tuna Champions has been tagged in a post. Tuna Champions has been tagged in a comment. Recreational anglers are now using us as a resource. They're going, check out Tuna Champions, look at what they're doing. And the interesting thing to note here is that if we do our job well, if we absolutely create behavioural change in the recreational fishery, we should be obsolete. We shouldn't be needed because the recreational fishers have got there themselves. Before, <laughs> I've seen this the last few days in a few presentations, the treble hook. We did the science, 60% of fish are likely to survive uh, post-release after an angling event if you use a treble hook. Make the switch to singles. Obviously, we like to use nice, easy, catchy mottos as well. 83% are likely to survive. What do we do? We get that message out there. Gets even cooler. The Riviera Port Lincoln Classic is one of the most famous classics in Australia catching tuna. One year, they recommended that all of their participants in the competition run single hooks. The next year we went back, they adopted it. It was now in the rules and regulations that you could only fish single hooks. They were adopting the Tuna Champions messaging. Tackle World Port Lincoln were offering free switchovers from trebles to singles for every client that came in and purchased a hard body lure. Beneficial for them, beneficial for us. We're getting the messaging out there, they're selling the gear. Mutually beneficial relationship. Of course, we spread the message, but there are people out there who can spread the message even better for us using networks. <coughs> Recreational fishers are a diverse group of people. As you would have heard in the survey before, we're looking at Males, predominantly 25, 30 to 55, 60 years old. With this diverse group of people, it's really important we spread the message with our diverse group of people. Um, therefore, we have Tuna Champions ambassadors. We have two sitting in the front of the room here uh, from TV fishing fanatics, the Worthlings, um, celebrity chefs, Esther Restaurant, one of the top tier restaurants in Sydney, uh, AFL star, that's the greatest sport in the world, by the way, Patrick Dangerfield. Um, and it right through to commercial operators. So over on the right-hand side there, we have TK Offshore Fishing. He is one of the most popular commercial fishers in the world. And what's incredible and important to note here, that when you're developing a stewardship program, there are other people out there who have an incredible amount of information from years of doing or being a part of an industry or a fishery. He has had 30 years fishing for Southern Bluefield, or for tuna in general, and the better he cares for his catch, the more money he makes. So if anyone's going to be the best at caring for their catch, it's going to be the people who are making top dollar from it. So he's been an integral part, and vice versa. We've been able to help him with some um, science that we've done over the time. Obviously, social media, it's huge. We can now access people in their living rooms, on their couch, any time of day, anywhere in the world. So we have a growing Facebook community and Instagram community that we target pretty heavily. We post a whole range of things on there. Um, most importantly, we love to share other people's things that align with our messaging. We're not just limited to sharing our own content. We love to share everybody else's as well. Um, and in particular, these migratory route or these migratory paths in the middle there, they do, do really well. And we find a lot of people reshare our content in regional and on a global scale. You can't forget face to face, bums on seats. People who want to be there and are sitting on a seat have shown up to hear you speak and often that's a massive impact for us. We can, I can put a social media post out and you can keep scrolling, right? I don't want to see that. But if you're purposely getting in the car and driving to come in and listen to us talk, it means you're invested in what we're saying. You're invested in what we're saying. So that's a big one for Tuna Champions. We get out to talk nights, game fishing clubs, um, Conferences, as you can see, a whole range of different ways that we get out and about with the public. We also sell merchandise. This is not a monetary venture. This is about exposure. Everyone in this room knows the Golden Arches because it's a clear and recognisable brand and we go there on Sunday when we have a hangover. Everyone knows about it. That's what we aim to do with Tuna Champions, okay? Everyone knows when they see the logo, we hope they go, that's Tuna Champions, we know what they do, we know what they're about. Can't discount other methods of communication as well. We also do uh, podcasts, articles, e-newsletters, uh, info cards, code of practices. So any way we can get the message out there, we will. And we can't forget the hub. Um, 
I can stand here and talk to you or share a social media piece, but often whatever we put online is in a bite size. We want recreational anglers. You know, you're out there in metres as well, catching fish. The last thing you want to be doing is going, what was the third dot point on the Tuna Champion social media post? I can't remember. So often what we post is one message, one clear message only, and that's decipherable enough for recreational anglers. But if they want to get all of our content, they can have a, head over to the hub. So on here we have videos from um, dispatching fish, fish, releasing fish, uh, right through to slicing sashimi up with wasabi and soy on your plate. So it's worth checking it out if you get the chance. Unfortunately, when Tuna Champions came about at the commencement of the program, we didn't really have a baseline study to see how effective our program was. But it did line up with the recreational survey that was conducted in 2018-19 for Southern Bluefin Tuna. And in this survey, we asked recre recreational fishers, do you catch tuna? Have you heard of the Tuna Champions program? Since hearing of the Tuna Champions program, are you now taking ice? Are you treating your fish any differently? And these were the results. So up to 50% of all SBT fishers had heard of tuna champions depending on the state. That's our reach. And it's important to remember this is only 12 months since the commencement of the program. This is the gold. Up to 25% of SBT fishers who had heard of TC said they were now taking more ice on a fishing trip. Up to 15% said they were now putting fish on ice who weren't doing it before. Up to 20% of SBT fishers were now brain spiking fish more often than before. Up to 15% were now removing internal organs soon after dispatching the fish. And 10% more were now bleeding the fish. Perhaps our biggest message is that anyone can be a part of the change. It's the small things that make the biggest difference. And as I mentioned before, if we keep going down the path we're going, which is seeing this behavioural change happen in front of our eyes, I won't have a job soon and I hope we get to that day. So thank you very much. I just want to acknowledge to um, ARF in this process and obviously our funding from the Australian Government via FRDC. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, India, not just for your talk, but also your impressive work in this space. Um, I think it's a pretty powerful example of um, very good and effective science communication translating through to incredible um, stewardship outcomes. So thank you. So next up, I'll just wait till we... And excuse me, Michelle, and everyone else in the room, we've got an incorrect schedule. If you've got an app, you'll have hopefully be getting a message. Uh, the last speaker in this room for the day was to be Serena Liu. She's not presenting this afternoon, but will be available tomorrow uh, in a workshop. So choose another session for the last one today. Thank you. All right, so next up, we've got Joella, Jo Ellen Wilson, and she is a Habitat Program Manager with Bonefish and Tarpon Trust, um, and she will be giving us a presentation today about working with anglers towards marine habitat. Thanks, Joellen. Do you know how to load this? Um, we Thanks so much. My name is Joellen Wilson with Bonefish and Tarpon Trust, and today I'll be talking about working with anglers, but really mostly talking about a habitat focus and management of marine recreational fisheries. And if any of you were in the same room for Aaron Adams' talk uh, before the coffee break, this is kind of a build on of that. He talked about the overarching problems that we have in Florida and the United States, and so hopefully I'll be able to provide some of the solutions that we're looking toward implementing habitat and fisheries management. For a little bit of context, Florida is in the southeastern United States. We have about 
8,400 kilometers of coastline, which is about two-thirds of the coastline of Queensland and about three times the amount of coastline in Victoria. Obviously, I had to provide my brag board. All the keynote speakers inspired me. But Florida has tons of opportunities for recreational fishing, fishing in inshore, nearshore, and also offshore. And I'm really proud to say that all of these are from the same estuary where I was born, raised, and where I now raise my family in southwest Florida and in Charlotte Harbor. Uh, looks like I need to update this, but as Aaron said earlier, Florida has a large recreational saltwater fishery economic impact. I have 10 billion, but it looks like it's been bumped up to over $11 billion. But these depend on healthy and also available habitats. We've already lost about 44% of our wetlands, um, a third of seagrass in one of our um, biggest estuaries in Florida Bay, and also about 50% of mangroves statewide. And I also include available habitats because on the east coast of Florida, we manage for mosquitoes. And so for mosquito control, we've impounded about 85% of the mangrove habitat. So it's there, it's just not accessible. And that's a whole talk in itself of what we're working on over there. But um, available habitats along with healthy habitats. So our current management relies on agency surveys where our state biologists are, are going out, they're netting, they're counting, measuring fish. They're also doing angler surveys at the boat ramps, on the, on the charter boats, at the fishing piers, asking people what they're catching, what they're targeting, um, how long they've been fishing for. And these inform our stock assessments, which again is our, our traditional way of managing fisheries. And so this provides kind of the counts for the year classes. And the output is our fisheries regulations for that specific species, right? So as the stocks dwindle, so these are kind of the slot sizes, uh, what's your max or minimum size, our seasonal closures. Um, so as the stocks dwindle, the regulations just become stricter and stricter. Currently, uh, for a species I'll be talking about, our, our take limit is only four inches, right? It's 28 to 32 inches, just because it's gotten smaller and smaller, um, especially even in my lifetime. So there's really no habitat component included in these stock assessments, and more specifically, vulnerable juvenile habitats. So the two sport fish species that I'll be talking about today are the Atlantic tarpon on the left, the common snook on the right. Obviously, you know that I'm from Bonefish and Tarpon Trust, so I kind of use these interchangeably. They use uh, the same habitat. Both of these fish are, can be found in the same habitats, which I'll be discussing um, in a minute. So when we're talking to our donors and our funders, we talk in terms of tarpon. However, when we talk in terms of state management agency, because tarpon are predominantly catch and release only and not regulated by our state management agency, uh, we talk in terms of snook and something that they can actually manipulate the regulations for. Atlantic tarpon are a highly prized game fish. They can grow to well over 100 kilograms, massive body size. They're also really fun to catch for a, such a big fish. They're usually in clear, shallow water. When you hook up to a tarpon, they're jumping in the air, and it's quite fantastic to see a fish that big uh, you know, be that acrobatic. They're also extremely economically valuable. BTT has funded quite a few economic studies um, throughout the state and then also throughout the Caribbean and, and Central America. Um, and we found that tarpon just in the estuary where I'm from, Charlotte Harbor alone, um, were generating over $110 million annually for just local anglers fishing for tarpon. And that's not even including our, our large tourism sector where people are coming to fish for the big tarpon. Snook, on the other hand, are culturally important throughout Florida. Um, also driving tourism, as you can see, they're on one of our state license places. And this is also a species of interest by our state management agency. Snook are highly managed in Florida and for both the fisheries aspect and the angler satisfaction. So my colleagues and I collaborated with our state management agency to publish a manuscript that showed how juvenile snook can be used as both an umbrella species to protect 55 other native species of fish and also a flagship species, kind of that charismatic megafauna to serve as a poster child specifically for these mangrove lined tidal creeks. Sometimes it's hard for anglers to wrap their heads around this habitat or it seems like there's a ton of habitat. How can that be, you know, impact this specific location where I'm at? How does that impact the fishery? But when you start looking at the big picture, you know, 50% of mangroves already lost in Florida, um, everything counts. 
So a little bit of life history, and I'll talk specifically about tarpon since uh, snook are pretty similar, and, and Aaron covered that earlier. But they spawn typically in the summers near the full and new moons. Um, we have the continental shelf on the west coast of Florida, and tarpon need about 100 meters um, in order to spawn. We think that the deep dive and the rocket to the surface helps them expel uh, the eggs, um, it, which we refer to as broadcast spawning. So they've got a go about 80 to 100 miles out on the west coast, but only five to 10 miles out on the east coast. Then once the eggs fertilize and hatch, they begin the larval phase, so that the tiniest tarpon looks like um, they're in the left cephalus phase for about 30 days. And then they start making their way back inshore, up into the estuaries and into these tidal creek systems. And again, this is a shared habitat by juvenile tarpon and snook. So typically they're backwater systems. They're also tidal, right? So they're not moving up into the rivers. They're specifically in these tidal creek areas that are ephemerally connected. Our storm season also coincides with our summers and with the spawning. So a lot of times these uh, larvae are coming in on high water events, either very high tides or storm events. We often see a lot of recruitment um, very good recruitment on storm years, um, making habitats accessible that are only accessible when we have these really high water events. So these juvenile tarpon and snook are dependent on these specific habitats. However, they're the most vulnerable because they're in such close proximity to humans. So the threats that we see, and as you can see outlined in the picture, are nutrient runoff. Florida is known for its lush green grass and golf courses. But if you're right next to salt water, you've got to do a lot of maintenance in order to maintain that uh, green grass through um, lawn fertilizers and other things coming from our roads. We also have problems with septic leaching when you're uh, when your septic tank is below the water table, all of that is just leaching right out into the water column. Also, altered freshwater flows. Uh, because these creeks are tidal, they also depend on a freshwater source that's usually a little bit more inland in the landscape. And once you divert that freshwater, all of a sudden you've created issues with these tidal creeks because they're not getting the natural freshwater flow. We also see habitat degradation and alteration. You can see in the right-hand corner we've had some potentially uh, natural coastal ponds that now look a lot more like a retention pond for neighborhoods, for uh, storm water management, and then total habitat loss through development. So BTT has created a framework with very straightforward solutions to include habitat and marine fisheries management, including, including converting septic to sewer, um, also, managing our freshwater flow, which is a big issue in Florida. Some of you may have heard of Lake Okeechobee and uh, diversion of water there. Um, also, just protecting the natural habitats. If we find, you know, again, back to that 50% of mangrove habitats, if we find a natural habitat that's naturally functioning, we need to really put a barrier around that, protect those habitats, and that's currently not happening. Um, and then also habitat restoration. So here it is in, in a little bit different um, format. So we, this is where the citizen scientist comes in. So we use the anglers to identify because obviously if we want to start protecting and restoring habitats, we need to first know where they are. So identifying habitats, characterizing habitats, then we do an assessment of the habitat. If we find that it's a natural habitat, then we recommend that for uh, protection to our fisheries management agency. Or if it's degraded, we, re we recommend that for restoration. So in 2016, in order to identify habitats, uh, we started looking to anglers. So we used social media posts on all different platforms, um, hung signs in the tackle shops. I gave dozens of presentations at different fishing clubs around the state. Also word of mouth, if I saw on social media, somebody was catching these small fish. And also when you get a fish that's over 100 kilograms and you say we're targeting small tarpon, that has a very different interpretive meaning. Um, so finding these little guys is a very niche fishery and very specific. Um, there's also a micro tarpon tournament in Florida, about two hours north of us. So I would attend that, and um, as part of the, the tournament, I would actually give a presentation. They've also helped us with some genetic material and fin clips, and then they would come back and, and very confidentially tell me their spots. So another thing about BTT is we work very closely with anglers and guides, and every, all the data that they give us is very confidential, and we have a lot of ways of keeping it so that we're not uh, handing it off to, to other people. 
So this type of things that we ask the anglers, right? Where's the specific location? What size fish are you seeing? Is it multiple size classes? Because we really want to target locations that are just the little guys. Um, we don't want to see 20 pound fish in, with five inch fish. Also, what months out of the year? This is going back to those ephemerally connected locations. Are they there year round like they should be? Or do you only see them at certain times of the year because maybe it's a ditch that dries up in the winter time and it's not viable habitat? And then finally, we ask them, would you classify this habitat as natural or altered? And a lot of times we see in logbook programs, people log their catches, but they're not really classifying the habitat. So not only can we discern the catch information, but we're also getting that habitat assessment from the anglers. And we found that it's pretty accurate. So we've uh, currently collected over 300 locations from over 100 anglers. Two thirds of those locations were altered. So this really just underscores the need for habitat restoration. So in 2021, at this point, we've got a bunch of points on a map. What do we do with those, right? So in 2021, we see, received private funding for a specific county, uh, Charlotte County in Southwest Florida. And we were able to uh, use GIS firms to map these sites um, where natural sites could be, again, recommended for protection. And then the degraded sites, we knew they weren't all created equal for habitat restoration, right? Sometimes you have um, a pocket in the back of a marina, or sometimes you just have something along the lines of dam removal or creating that fish passage. Um, so we created a ranking system to prioritize these sites for habitat restoration using layers like feasibility, right? How much money is it going to take? How much effort? How much time do we need a permit? Um, also, biology of the fish. Are these, can larvae actually access these places? Connectivity. Is there an opportunity for fish as they immigrate from these locations to move into more natural habitat? But if we're going to propose habitat restoration, we first need to know, is habitat restoration a viable solution? Can we effectively create or enhance nursery habitat? And can we measure it? So in 2016 in Southwest Florida, we started a habitat restoration project. These six lower canals had tidal access through an inlet. It was originally a development project where people still own parcels today that are residential saltwater access, but it's now within the confines of a preserved state park, so they, can't access, they can access it, but they can't build there. Um, but having multiple canals also presented a unique opportunity. So we could test, not only test is habitat restoration uh, can it be successful? Is it a viable solution? But also what specific habitat design? And this is a talk in itself, and I don't know how crunch we are for time, but we were able to use these six canals and uh, do different treatments of those things that we were seeing in the natural nursery habitats. So, oh, this, I don't think this updated. All right, so uh, pre-restoration, we, uh, tagged, again, this is another presentation in itself, uh, tagged in uh, 140 snook and one tarpon, post-restoration 670 snooks. So you can see that we had quite the increase before and after habitat restoration. So again, just running through briefly, all three treatments had higher sport fish abundance, growth, and immigration rates. So ultimately, yes, habitat restoration does work for sport fish nursery habitat for juvenile tarpon and snook. It can be successful. For those that are curious, treatment three, which is kind of that ephemeral connection um, that has cut off fish conveyance at some times during the year, uh, seemed to have the highest growth. So that almost seemed to be like the smaller fish coming in initially. And then treatment two, which had open access, continuous fish passage throughout the year in a, a little bit of a deeper hole, um, had the highest immigration. So it seems like a combination of these two is what we want to uh, model when we uh, move into more habitat restoration projects. So our mapping can tell us where to protect and restore. Coral Creek, right? We know how to restore. So now it's time to apply the knowledge. So BTT is now moving forward with habitat restoration as of this month. So until this point, we've monitored, um, we've provided input, we've also designed, um, but now we're actually putting in for bids for habitat restoration. Um, so all the NOAA constituents in the room, please keep us in mind for, for March when we apply for more funding. Uh, but 
So these angler provided sites, we're actually um, looking at six of them specific to Charlotte County. Um, and then they'll, this will get us through that preliminary habitat assessment and design. And then we'll be able to select four of those sites, move those through final design. Then you move on to permitting and then finally construction. Um, unfortunately, and this is another presentation in itself, Tim knows, but it just takes forever to get through habitat restoration and to that what we refer to as shovel ready. Um, so if we can start moving these projects through the pipeline, um, that's the best way to do it. So we've also put in for funding to, uh, with NOAA, <laughs> we've also put in for funding to create a vulnerability index. So this would be used for county land use planners, um, kind of as a, a software system um, in their database. And this gives us a potential way that we can circumvent our fisheries management and go straight to the development problems that we face. So what the vulnerability index would do is overlay these habitat layers, right? The, the restoration prioritization sites, also the natural habitats. Uh, we're looking into funding um, a hydrodynamic modeling study for this specific county. And we'd overlay that with potential development locations. And then that way it would flag a parcel in, this, in the land use planning system when somebody tries to put in for a building permit. So example, a natural site that's at high risk for development would rank really high on the VI. So we would try to dissuade development and we're still working on ways to do that, um, maybe increasing restrictions, or at the very least move density units. And I know I'm getting into really jargon and land use planning. But again, if our state management agency isn't gonna protect the habitats, we've gotta figure out a way that uh, we can have them not developed. So I'm using juvenile tarpon and snook specifically to focus on the tidal creeks to include the specific habitat and fisheries management plans. But really, I encourage you to think about this presentation in your terms of your own species and their respective vulnerable habitat or habitats to integrate those into your marine fisheries management plans. And I'm so happy to see Cassie in here from Ozfish. She gave a very similar presentation, and it seems like our Australian constituents are having the same problems that, that we have, especially if we can increase these number of juvenile fish, then you don't have to regulate the adult fish in that fishery as hard um, if we can improve these habitats, and specifically the, the vulnerable nursery habitats. Ultimately, until we start including habitat and fisheries management plans, we can't manage effectively, and ultimately we'll lose our fisheries, because without healthy habitats, we don't have healthy fisheries. That's all I have for you today. Thank you very much, Joanne. And just absolutely phenomenal amount of work that goes into habitat restoration. Um, so I might just get our speakers up the front if I could, and we'll have a bit of a panel session. If everybody wants to hang around for that, we've got about 10 minutes. really interesting spectrum of different sort of stewardship models here. We've got your not-for-profit conservation organisation, you've got your angler-led stewardship program, and you've also got the government-driven um, legislative um, sort of model for stewardship as well. So, yep. yeah, it's a really interesting spectrum up here. Um, so any any questions for our speakers? Yep. Yes, Cathy? Hello, my question is for you, Joellen, and I love that presentation. Um, and I was interested to hear you talking about land use planning because we've just started to look at that too and kind of go around, uh, you know, the state protections and go straight to land use planning and that's going to be a road for us too. But my question is, um, I was interested to hear you talking about, you know, recording and, and asking your anglers about whether the habitats were altered and, and identifying that. I, I just wanted how, many, how much additional info did they need to sort of be prepared, I guess, to um, make that assessment of that difference in the habitats, whether they were altered or, or natural? Good question. <laughs> Thanks so much. Really good question. And so I purposely left that vague. The, exactly what I put on the slide is the exact information that I gave to the anglers, because I really wanted to see, again, we give them a lot of credit for being able to provide catch data, uh, but when it comes to kind of those subjective terms, like that natural or altered, um, it was cool to be, sometimes I would go in the field with them, and I'd be able to see part of their thought process of looking around, and would you say it's natural or altered? Sometimes you take people to a certain place, and you don't realize that 
you know, when you turn around, all of a sudden there's a development community behind you um, that's feeding that specific location. Um, so quite honestly, they're very critical. And I think that also gave them something to think about. Um, on their kind of grading form, um, I gave them the options of natural, um, something like slightly altered or heavily altered. And so again, there's another presentation on this, but I, then we sent um, field techs or myself out into the field and we graded as well. And they matched up 100% with what the scientists were able to um, discern as natural. So again, we can rely on anglers to classify habitat. Any other questions? Yep, one at the back. Scott? Uh, this one's again um, to Joellen, um, but it's more, um, I'm interested in knowing what relationship have you guys uh, developed with the parks authorities, uh, like marine parks and national parks, in working with them to protect the habitat as well? Because uh, definitely out here we've had our share of challenges of working with parks because when we lose access, but is there a relationship or have you developed a relationship where you're able to work with them as well in protecting that habitat? <laughs> yeah, great question. Um, so specifically where I was doing uh, my work in the regions of Florida, we don't have a ton of national parks there. However, in the southern end of Florida, I, I should also say that I have um, two other colleagues here internationally. So I have Justin Lewis from the Bahamas, where he works with Bahamas National Trust. And BTT, Justin, you don't have to flash me a hand signal, but BTT was um, aided in uh, six, six new national parks in 2015. So 25 new areas, six national parks um, recognized in the Bahamas in 2015, and then 21 new areas in 2021. Um, and right behind him is Adiel Perez, Dr. Adiel Perez, who's our uh, Belize, Mexico scientist. And so he also works with national parks um, in his area. Um, in the Florida Keys, where we also do have some tarpon, uh, not a ton of juvenile tarpon work, we work with Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary, um, and also Everglades National Park. Um, so where we've been looking at juvenile tarpon thus far, um, we haven't crossed those barriers yet. However, BTT does a really good job of integrating all different regional, national uh, partnerships, and then same with the guides and anglers that use these resources. Um, so um, these guys may have some struggles that they could talk about, um, but for the most part, just, just preemptively gaining those relationships has helped us. I think, um, is it Ariel first? Yeah. Is there one behind? That's okay. 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 So my, my question is for Tim. Can, can you um, fund their projects? <laughs> that was my question. You stole my question. <laughs> <laughs> no comment at this time. <laughs> I look forward to reviewing the application. I'll say that. I look forward to reviewing it. I've got a good background now. We'll be there was a lot of information uh, in there. The results of that decision. Yeah. <laughs> I think Adia was. Yeah, yeah. Kylie? <laughs> Adia was, was next. Getting a little bit of peer pressure there. <laughs> um, good question, Joe. Um, like, for instance, maybe to um, like similar, similar, similar issues like in Belize with development. Are there like programs or lessons that we can learn from projects like this that we can also like adapt or apply elsewhere? Um, especially on the last slides with the um, with the index. Um, that's one of the good things about science in that. Um, sometimes we don't need to reinvent the wheel, but we can just adapt and look at what already exists and from there move on, like a protocol, a guideline that maybe can also be applied for, for Belize, Mexico maybe, as like where to start with, um, to kind of replicate the good work that you guys are also doing there. Thanks, Adiel. So I know from personal experience and those of you from the States, um, 
building a house in 2018, right, we already have species of concern. We have the gopher tortoise, we have scrub jay mitigation, right? So we already have in place um, in the mindset for developers that, hey, you've got to develop around certain species. The habitat is somewhat there, but from what we've seen, which is, it's kind of a shame, is that with enough money and with enough influence, you can kind of get around the habitat restrictions, right? So we think, oh, wetlands, you can't build there. But then all of a sudden, you know, Army Corps will pass it. Or our Department of Environmental Protection, um, they'll provide input, but it's not a, a hard no. So I think we already have in place kind of those, those species guidelines. And when we can start tying them to the economics, people are coming to Florida to fish. If you start building on the land where the fish are, you're not going to be able to fish. It's as simple as that. So I think once, if we can put it in terms of a species for now and maybe maybe progress to a habitat, um, the opportunity is definitely there. Uh, Bryce? I think we've got time for a few more if everybody's happy to stick around until four. Thanks. I was gonna ask Joellen another question, but that would be cruel at this point. So <laughs> <laughs> I'll ask Tim one, a nasty one, sorry. Uh, so, um, I don't know if you were at my talk earlier, but we, in the UK we have issues with lack of trust between both commercial and recreational fishers and, uh, and scientists and particularly government agencies. So you sort of hinted on uh, th about that in your talk, and you're obviously doing a lot of great programs. You know, what, what are you guys doing to get the, the anglers to trust you more? Like, what's your secrets? Um, I wish I had a secret and I could share it with you, but um, I think it was my first conclusion is engage locally. It, it's a matter of showing up and meeting anglers where they are. A lot of the folks here, I work at our headquarters office, but a lot of the NOAA folks here are, are regional recreational coordinators whose their job is to go out and meet them at the fishing docks, at fishing clubs, and and try to build those relationships and connections because really in a post-COVID world, what we built up before has really gone away. And it's just caused more distrust and more wild things on social media flying around and everything else. So it's just a matter of hitting the reset button and meeting anglers where they are. At our last summit, we had a guy from Oregon said, Noah needs to get back to warm-blooded data collection. You need to come talk to us, come work with us, because right now the trust is, 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 is big. The distrust, excuse me, okay. is big. Yeah, so it, it, we are starting from the ground up and it's face-to-face it's -face for us. I think, no, that is a good, a really good tip. <laughs> it's a tip, but not a secret. Well, I mean, there are no secrets. Thanks, Rob. Thank you. I'll just recognise myself. I'm the chair of Victorian Recreational Fishing Peak Body VR Fish. My question is to Indiana. India. Brilliant and inspiring presentation for a start. That was magnificent. I really can't ask many questions at it, but there's one issue that keeps coming past me, and that is charter boat operators and recreational fishers taking photos of huge catches of barrel tuna and displaying them on Facebook. Are you doing anything about the education of that? Just to take only what you need, please, or take a photo of only what you need? Yep, that's a great question. That's a really great question. One of the biggest things that we find is recreational fishers look up to charter operators and they look at them and they want, they're inspired by them, they're in awe of what they do. They catch a lot of fish and often they're very good at it. It's hard not to be when you spend 365 days a year on the water. Very soon, and you're getting a bit of insight here, we are launching a golden charter operator program. So we are actually giving charter operators the opportunity to get essentially a certification that they are Tuna Champions ambassadors. So that they take care of their catch, what they post online will be fish in ice bags, fish being released gently back into the water. And I think what we'll see, I mentioned in my talk, social sanctioning. With this, I think we'll actually see charter operators similar to an MSC tick. You go to the supermarket, you look for an MSC tick. The same thing we're hoping will happen when people go fishing and they want to pick their, their charter operator. They look for the golden charter operator sticker. 
So that's one way we're looking at, at um, combating that issue. But the biggest thing for us is our messaging is really simple and we keep it exactly, only keep what you need for a feed. And we share a lot of that. Recently, um, there was a runoff tuna off Port Mac and we saw a lot of images circulating online with fish on their noses. Um, and we don't discourage it because we find if you discourage, they'll switch off. Mm. You can't tell fishers what to do. It just doesn't work. It doesn't work. You have to lead the horse to water, but you, they've got to drink. So what we're finding is happening is they're becoming the odd ones out. It's becoming cool to care for your catch and that social sanctioning is now occurring where they're getting a lot of hate comments. I hate to use that, but a lot of hate comments online under the post. So next time you see them, I really encourage to open the comments because more recently than ever, there are people on there. The behavioural change is definitely occurring. So sorry for the long one, but yeah, there's some cool stuff coming. Mm. I love it. There was another question in front of Rob. Um, one more for Indy. It's not a serious one, so you can relax. <laughs> <laughs> I was uh, worried that you didn't clarify what you, the um, the meaning of ice in that. You said there was an increase in ice. I was just <laughs> hoping that that was uh, <laughs> yeah, I didn't know the right kind of ice. <laughs> well, thank you for that. I'll take that. I'm taking you. ice. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? I had one, if I could, of Indy as well. Um, you sort of answered part of it, which was, you know, you've been so successful with what you've done so far, and I really wanted to sort of hear about what's what's next. Um, but also, I guess, what are your, um, I guess, what are your targets? You said, you know, within a year you achieved that, that incredible outcome. Yeah. Um, so, is there? Do you have a target? Um, our, our target is to be bigger than Ben Hur. I think <laughs> we're aiming for the stars, awesome. and if we miss it, we land on the moon. <laughs> so, um, look for us. I think global is obviously the next thing. With the expansion to yellowfin and longtail, not not longtail, but yellowfin, it gives us a global reach now. So, mm -hmm. southern bluefin tuna was just the southeastern states of Australia, our neighbours, New Zealand, um, and now with yellowfin, we have access to so many countries around the world. So I would say that is the where to from here. Just keep going, keep plugging away. The movement is happening. Um, and, you know, at the Ultimate Fishing Expo on the weekend, I was talking to fishers and just having those simple conversations about how they've heard about us and they've changed the way they're fishing and they're telling their mates off. It's just picking up so much traction now that I'm hoping in the next few years Tuna Champions will be a recognisable brand around the world. And that's what I was hinting at with the McDonald's comment. Yep. <laughs> so brilliant. that's where we want to be. Yep. And they've got a brilliant asset in you. And, um, yeah, oh, that sort of you. champion that makes these thank sort of programs much. really, really successful, I think. I appreciate that. Thank you. I, I, I try. <laughs> I just love fish. <laughs> so. And that comes back to, yeah, the interesting observations from the, from the national um, survey results. I think, you know, the, the stewardship, 75% of um, anglers identify themselves as stewards. And um, that positive correlation between avidity and, and the passion, passion that you have. Um, so, yeah, brilliant. Any other questions? No? Let's um, call it a day and go and enjoy the afternoon. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>